Hi friends, Lorelai Black here from Blade and Broom, and this week we're going to be talking about heresy, sorcery, and the devil in witchcraft. So thank you all for joining in on today's rather controversial set of topics. We are just going to be doing kind of an introductory look at these three kind of interrelated concepts um, and sort of debunking a few myths around them um, in the sense that a lot of folks want to say that the devil does not exist in witchcraft and um, I'm going to be pointing out how he absolutely does. Um, the devil does exist in witchcraft. Um, and I think it's probably a good idea for us to start there. So before we get too far into things, I guess I'll go ahead and acknowledge that I know that this topic, these topics, um, but particularly this idea of the devil in the craft, is going to be a little uncomfortable for some folks. And um, I'm gonna just have to be okay with that there's actually a lot within witchcraft that is uncomfortable for us the craft isn't necessarily supposed to be comfortable it, it's also not a cush cozy easy for the masses kind of experience either but i think one of the lies that we tell and i do think it's a lie i think it's a comfortable lie that gets told about witchcraft is that there's no devil in it um, and I think that this happens for a couple of reasons. One, it has been done out of a sense of safety. Um, people who get called witches historically have gotten killed over that title or have gotten ostracized or have had other very important things taken out of their lives, their children, their homes, their job security. It has not been safe to be called a witch. And a lot of people who are witches, have been witches, use very distinctly other terms for these arts. They call themselves by another name. They call their craft by another name. We are very privileged in this day and age and in countries where we are able to, um, because even today, not everybody can call themselves a witch. Um, and extending that idea, um, it is still not entirely safe to acknowledge that the horned deity figure, the horned great spirit figure that you work with, that, that is the bringer of magic into your world, that is the uh, initiator of mystery, um, that that masculine figure is a devil, is the devil. That's not a safe thing to say out loud. Um, it's not a safe thing to say in most spaces. You're not going to go into work and talk about that typically. Now some of you can certainly share in the comments about how you have done that and how it's been perfectly fine for you. We probably have certain protections at your job that allow you to do that. Most people don't feel safe doing that. They feel like their job would be threatened. They feel like um, their family relationships would be in jeopardy. They feel like um, their children might get taken from them. They feel like their neighbors would treat them differently or possibly even harm them. It's not safe. So um, so we have, as a group, said or allowed it to be said that there is no devil in witchcraft. And it is true to an extent that there is no Christian devil in witchcraft. There isn't. There is no Christian Satan in witchcraft. Um, that guy isn't here. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, and it takes a little bit of exploring of what that even is, of who that figure is, to be able to say with a degree of certainty that, that he is not part of traditional witchcraft or Wicca or most of the um, practices that we call witchcraft today. Hi friends, 
I am just jumping in here really fast because I wanted to say hi and welcome to friends both old and new. Thank you so much for joining us for this particular video and just to the channel in general. I'm so excited about the growth that we're having. Um, thank you so much for being a part of that. And also I have a couple of really quick announcements that I want to get out there. One is that the channel now has its very own Patreon page. So check that out. It is uh, patreon.com slash blade and broom. Super easy to find um, and super easy to help support us in any way that you are able if you are interested. Another really quick thing is that the Red Thread Academy of Traditional American Folkloric Witchcraft is finally available with its first full course, um, which is like a whole year of study. Um, and it's a way for you to study with me directly. And I mean pretty directly. So you can just buy the book if you're interested and, and just do it on your own. I'm cool with that. But you can also, um, if you would like, uh, purchase the book and then join the uh, Facebook group that I have set up for that and interact with other people who are also taking the course. And that is available in my Etsy shop, which is linked down in the description box below. So, um, lots of options. There are other things that I'm getting up to down in my link tree, including uh, writing for Evoke publication every month. It is a fantastic deal, $3 a month, gives you access to lots and lots of witchy and pagan lifestyle articles and all kinds of goodness. And of course, I'm writing about traditional witchcraft, so um, good time. <laughs> and and there's more, but I'll stop there now and just say, like, subscribe, do all those things, share. That all helps out the channel and helps me get even better stuff out to you and be able to interact in lots of different ways. So, um, you know, like, ding the bell, do all those things. Um, and back to the content. So looking at who that guy is, um, he is an an anti-Jehovah type figure who in um, biblical texts, which are of course an amalgamation of a lot of different books that were written um, long, long ago. <laughs> and I, I don't want to belabor the point of like how he came to be or what, what he is, but um, the term Satan actually derives out of a Hebrew word that means adversary or opposer. Um, and it's specifically um, somebody who is in opposition or adversarially, adversarially <laughs> in opposition to Jehovah, um, the Hebrew Christian God. There are plenty of people uh, who have done lots and lots of excellent scholarship on on this guy, right? <laughs> and on how this guy ended up getting uh, attributes that look like the many horned gods of uh, Europe. And there are, there are many horned gods um, whose features then definitely got sort of imprinted upon this, um, this opposer, this adversary. And there are several different titles, several different figures um, that sort of got all wrapped in together to become what is sort of the contemporary understanding of Satan. Um, but really, if you pick them apart, if you pick that guy apart, he's a blend of a bunch of different things. He gets equated with Lucifer and Azazel both of whom are angels and also Lucifer is not an angel. Lucifer is a much older name or title um, that belonged to a god, um, a Roman god of that name, obviously, Lucifer. Um, and the name itself means light bringer. Um, and there is an older title or epithet, which in Greek just means adjective, so it's a descriptive term, um, of phosphorus, phosphorus, that means light bringer or light bearer, that was applied to um, many deities. So both Lucifer and Phosphorus have been used as descriptors or descriptions for several different deities. 
who are associated with the dawn and with torch bearing um, and with the planet Venus, um, which is seen as a herald uh, within the night sky. Um, and so um, those deities, some of them are masculine and some of them are feminine. So specifically, obviously, Venus in the Roman pantheon and Aphrodite in the Greek um, and Ishtar before either of them, <laughs> Ishtar and Anna, um, was also um, described with these words as being a, being a light bringer. Um, so part of what gets interesting about this um, and that it does very much inform our understanding of our folkloric devil. And I would like to point out the difference then that we have within our craft, within our witchcraft, um, the folkloric devil standing in opposition to, <laughs> there's that opposer, um, standing in opposition to the theological devil. So the theological devil is that Christian Satan. It's that Christian devil who at this point is very much a real and believed in figure, but he's not our guy. He's not who we're working with. We're working with this other guy um, who is maybe actually lots of different guys um, and, and maybe is one. We could see him archetypally in um, the sense of being sort of that amalgamation of several of these light bringers, horned gods, this force of illumination, of alchemy, of magic, um, and, um, and wisdom, and of that potency and that power and that, that sort of primal masculine magic that it's difficult to get into all of what that is right now and he's not the only big initiating force within witchcraft right so we have on the uh, as as a pairing to him um, not really in opposition to him at all but working very much in conjunction with him we have um, the, the dame or the queen. So we've got this idea, and I've talked about this before too, the devil and the dame or the devil and the queen. Um, and these end up being titles that we use for the leadership within a coven or ways that we even end up sort of seeing ourselves as witches as we grow. We sort of grow into these figures ourselves. Um, but that might be a discussion for another time <laughs> as far as how that evolution of spirit happens. And the thing is, we see within, um, we see within historical record, we see within folkloric record, we very much see sort of like his hoof prints through <laughs> the witch wood as well. Like we see him there um, and, and we know that witches historically have worked with uh, with somebody who is masculine, is horned, often, not always, but often, um, is a figure of the forest or of wild places in general, of desolate places, of lonely places, um, is sort of a wanderer between the worlds, um, and is an initiator into magic and into the craft and into particular kinds of wisdom and enlightenment. Okay, so I said we were gonna talk about three things. The devil in the craft is one. Um, and I've, again, just sort of only touched on the concept and um, uh, of him being here. So he's definitely somebody that we're going to talk more about but i think you'll find that you see him a lot whether you're practicing um, traditional witchcraft where we might actually very directly refer to him as the devil or um, as old horny um, 
or within um, Wicca and other versions of neo-paganism, you just see him referred to as the horned god or the horned one. But it's all the same guy, and it's still very much the devil, the folkloric devil, not the devil of the church. So then the next point that we were going to be talking about today is this idea of heresy. And as a transition to that, there's this kind of concept of like, why use the term devil uh, if we need to distinguish that it's the folkloric devil and not the theological devil? If it's going to ruffle that many feathers and cause that much upset, why not just use a different term? Why not say horned gods? Why not... Um, you know, why say things like Lucifer and devil if it's just going to make people upset and, and want to come after you with, you know, rope and pitchforks and pressing stones and, you know, things to see how combustible you are. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with, with, with two concepts. One is this idea that witchcraft is inherently heretical, and I'll talk about that in mere moments. And the other is that it's also inherently transgressive. After we've been practicing for a little while, I think we tend to forget how transgressive witchcraft and, and other forms of neo-paganism are, especially if we're very deeply immersed in the community. If we have time to be involved with, um, with large portions of the community, we get uh, a sense of freedom about saying, you know, I'm a witch, I'm a pagan, you know, I'm out here at Pagan Pride Day, and, and, um, and, and we forget how scary those terms are for other people, um, but they are. Those are actually really, for a lot of folks, those are still very, very frightening terms because they don't know what your sense of ethics is. They don't know where your boundary lines are. They don't know what to expect out of you. They know what to expect, generally speaking, from different denominations of Christianity, but frankly, they're still afraid of other people from different Abrahamic faiths, much less people that they don't even know what their book looks like. And certainly, like if you're writing your own book, like your book of shadows, you know, or if you're using some kind of arcane, um, grimoire they really really don't know what to make of you so so these are inherently sort of frightening concepts for folks and we have to remember that we chose them you know we we made a choice even if you were raised in a neo-pagan household even if you were raised in the craft to some extent you still had to choose this for yourself you know, as a baby, nobody sprinkled your head and baptized you as a witch. You might have had a witching, you know, or a wickening um, as, uh, as a one-year-old or as an infant. You know, I've um, seen that ceremony. My children have gone through ceremonies like that where they were blessed. But it is literally a ceremony that says, I will allow this child to make choices for themselves, but I'm going to protect them along the way and give them opportunities to choose. And that's what the word heresy actually means. And I think a lot of us don't know that these days um, because not everybody's raised in the church. And even for those of us that were, the word heresy still had, um, it still had the singe of, of the inquisition around it. You know, it still had this really fearful connotation around it that you must have done something terrible if you were being kicked out for heresy. Um, and I've witnessed that happening at the church that I used to attend. Um, I was actually very much brought up in the church, um, in a missionary Baptist church. And um, I've sat in service where people were removed from the roles because of heresy. I'm sure that I have been removed from the roles for heresy as well at this point, which is valid because frankly, I made a choice that was very different from, from the, that church um, and from any Christianity. I made a choice to practice witchcraft. And if you're watching this channel, probably so have you. And if you're very new to witchcraft, you probably still have that like tingle around the edges of like, oh my gosh, what am I getting into? Oh my gosh, is this okay? whoa, am I going to be in trouble for this on some sort of cosmic psychic level is, you know, am I going to get punished later? 
um, am I going to walk into a church and catch on fire? Like, you know, it, it has this really scary feeling around it for a lot of folks um, in the beginning. You really feel sort of the, the ice water down the spine of your choice and of your choosing, I think. You know, the action of choosing. It's important for us to remember that we are taking a strong active role by practicing witchcraft in our own lives. And whether you consider it a spiritual practice or or something else, because I, I get that it's not a spirituality for everybody. It's not a, a religious experience for everybody. It's not of exactly that category for everyone. But whatever it is, it was distinctly a choice. And it flies in the face of convention. It is transgressive. And it always has been. It always has been. In every civilized place, even in civilized places where magic has existed, and, um, and, uh, for, and I'm thinking back to like, um, the Chaldean writings and ancient Sumer and that type of thing where there were um, princely priests who practiced magic. You know, it was considered the royal art. Witches and sorcerers were on the outside of that. They were not the same. People who consorted with spirits in the way that most witches do, and certainly in the way that um, traditional witches do. Uh, witches, <laughs> witches, <laughs> sorry, which ends up being with that eye toward um, sort of a pre-modern context or uh, um, um, medieval woodcut sort of witchcraft. Certainly within traditional witchcraft, spirit communication, spirit bond, spirit relationship, um, and the familiar relationship is uh, inherently very much a part of it. And um, we see that extended in concept even into other types of witchcraft, into Wicca and, and um, neo-witchcraft um, in a lot of ways, just in the sense that that idea of a god friend or a personal deity, a patron deity, that didn't really exist in most um, polytheistic societies historically. That wasn't necessarily a thing in most of them. It did happen, so... Um, you know, certainly that's something worth researching and looking into, but, um, but it wasn't necessarily that common. Not everybody had that one deity that they had a special relationship with. So um, that's something that I think within a modern pagan context and within a modern witchcraft context where we see almost everybody saying, you know, my special deity, my patron deity um, is such and such, you know, or I'm dedicated to so and so. I think that really that has to do with um, sort of the inherent witchy longing for, need for, um, and foundation of the sorceress bond between uh, spirit and practitioner and the fact that we rely on that we go to somebody to help teach us a, a spirit somebody right we go to um, big spirits and then lesser known uh, maybe just personally known even other spirits to teach us and to 
um, guide us and encourage us and initiate us on some level and then also to help sort of like power and perform that magic it's not all just coming from us and energy that we raise that would deplete us um, by a lot um, we need that that tapping into what they are which is a lot bigger so and that's where that sorcery aspect comes in um, as opposed to magic um, as a distinction between the two terms and some people use those terms interchangeably and I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong certainly there's a lot of historical precedents for using those two terms absolutely interchangeably historically sorcery has tended to do more with spirit driven magical practices as sort of like a subset of magic maybe is even a more accurate way of talking about it. So that was a lot, um, a lot of conceptual things to sort of think about this time. Some of them might be a little bit controversial to think about. Um, and then again, some of you are gonna be like, yes, I'm so glad that somebody said it. Um, or I'm glad that another person has said it because certainly I'm not the first to say these things. <laughs> um, and I will link some articles and some books that have a little bit more reading that you can do on these topics if you're interested in, in digging in a little bit more. Um, and I would love to hear from you and to hear what you're thinking on these and maybe what you have found or experienced in, in using these terms for yourself. Yeah, that's what I got. So I'll see you back here on Monday at noon. Bye friends.